we will begin. Thank you. Okay, so, um, hello, everyone. I'm very happy to introduce Esther Polani, uh, who is a fellow at the University of Nova Gorica and also a visiting lecturer um, in media archaeology at the University of Udine, Italy. Uh, Esther completed her PhD at uh, Columbia University in New York, where she has also been a lecturer in art history and archaeology, uh, as well as at Pratt Institute in Brooklyn. Uh, her research and teaching involved the histories of vision and visuality, embodied forms of spectatorship, theories of the medium, uh, and so forth. And today she will present us um, a paper entitled Mobility Media, an archaeology of identity photography through science, art, and visual culture. So Esther, um, you may begin. Thank you. Um, also, thank you for, for inviting me to this wonderful platform. Um, I'm really excited to be able to present here, uh, particularly because I have developed this project since my move to Europe. Um, uh, and um, my particular point of view is uh, very much uh, formed by my training as a historian of film and photography, um, primarily art. Um, and what you will see is that this is a topic that sort of lends itself to a kind of dialogue that is very interdisciplinary. And so I'm drawing on um, the, the, the terms um, uh, and types of, of discourse that come from sort of a broad range of, of social science humanities um, discipline, but also the history of science. So. Um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really curious. Um, and so anything that like raises a question, I'm very curious um, about just because you will see different things in this. Um, okay. All right, so I, I have a talk that's approximately 35 minutes long. Um, uh, you, it, please stop me if it, if it seems to go over. Um, uh, okay, all right, I will also be uh, following. I will actually put my, my watch right here so I can have the time. Okay, here we go. I hope, yes, <laughs> it's working. <laughs> Mobility in the sense of freedom of persons choosing to move or reside in a state in which they have no prior citizenship was one of the four original freedoms defined in the treaty that ratified the European Union member states in 1957. In the past decade, this particular freedom, the freedom of movement, appears to have been significantly eroded. Mobility in the sense of migration, that is mobility of persons for reason of residency or employment, has become a point of contention among member states that it has divided more than unified, with measures affecting immigrants, refugees, and asylum seekers featuring at the core of recent electoral agendas. Several um, pay member states' deterrence of the mobility of migrants from outside the EU has resulted in the return to protocols and practices of controlling movement um, into and out of so sovereign territories. Among the most conspicuous of which has been the reestablishment of the by now largely defunct network of nation state borders. And while the reappearance of new walls, barricades and barbed wiring um, uh, along, alongside certain nation state borders since the mid 20 teens have made headlines. There have been other measures with less press and less physical visibility that have been set in place to manage and enforce mobility. The photographic identity document, meaning a document of state issued identity certification has become one such mobility management measure. The identity document constitutes a sort of technical interface between the state and our persons. It firstly accounts for our existence. To be accounted for by the state means to have been issued identity papers, birth certificates, naturalization papers, driver's licenses, etc. Identity papers also provide a set of operations by which to differentiate us from other existing persons on file. Each type of identity document utilizes a slightly different configuration of a set of by now universally used measures to document and identify people with techniques including recovering information noted at the time of birth, 
So place and date of birth, nationality, name of mother, um, information about the document itself, date and place of issue, document number. Yes, sorry. And information derived from the person through anthropomorphic measurement. Sometimes there's indication of height, um, visual discernment of their physical appearance. So eye color, skin color, hair color, um, and a range of graphic marks captured from our person and reproduced on the document. So handwritten, handwritten signature, uh, fingerprints, um, or photographs. These are the categories of identity verification by which our other documents are certified and by which we are made legible to the state. In other words, these are the measures by which we are acknowledged as living beings associated with a given territory. We are recognized to be subjects of a state through such instances of identification. Their cumulative record rather than our displacement, constituting our official mobility through time and space. This system of recognizing and instantiating state subjects through information produced and deposited in administrative archives is far from perfect, uh, as some of us have perhaps had opportunity to note when facing issues arising from a change of address or from the change in our facial morphologies over time, just to name a couple of um, uh, frequent discrepancies between your, you and your identity document. The relative usefulness of these measures of identification and the different epochs of social structure they reflect is one indication of the lengthy history of the identity document and the multiplicity of signs, markers, and systems by which our societies have attempted to document human life. Despite the technical obsolescence of several key features of the identity document, its reign has gone surprisingly unchallenged. In fact, over the centuries, its authority has only grown. Since the medieval era, the state has issued documents for purposes of identification, such as printed portraits of individuals. These were certified by means of signs such as seals, coats of arms, and by use of proprietary materials, such as watermarked, stamped, or signed paper, that originated in and certified the bearer as the property of a given state. Formalized between the, oh, sorry, no. I think I, I'm gonna stay here for a minute. Formalized between the 13th and 16th centuries as part of a larger diplomatic endeavor accessible to a very narrow range of citizens, identity documents were introduced, adopted, and standardized as international diplomatic currency in the form of passports and visas by governments across the globe throughout the first half of the 20th century. A good indication of the progressive rise of the identity document as a tool of diplomatic power is its role in granting access to mobility in the geophysical sense. The ability to cross nation state borders cannot be secured without identity documents even if possession of valid identity documents does not actually guarantee uh, one's rights to move or reside elsewhere. The need to be able to produce identity documents when asked for them has become so pressing, it is deemed so essential to modernity that a highly sophisticated network uh, now exists to produce and issue fraudulent identity documents in the shadow of the state. Uh, to risk imprisonment or deportation on account of forged papers appears to be preferable um, to not having papers. The rise and significance of the identity document is also noticeable in terms of the widened scope of situation in which individuals are subject to processing in the name of the state. Identity documents typically accompany most types of civil transaction involving the formal request for access. Um, so including the opening of a bank account, filing for healthcare, using a gym, a library, public transportation sometimes, signing um, up for membership to a supermarket chain, um, picking up mail, art, ordering alcohol at a bar, um, etc. Today, none of these are possible in certain countries without an identity document. And while some of these transactions are relatively routine, others, such as requesting access to medical care, a bank loan, or an educational program, involve potentially impactful decisions brought in the name of the state's population management and control. The increasing number of situations in which identification is requested accompanies the transfer of state power to non-state players, businesses and corporations that have acquired um, for money 
the right to decide who within the civilian population will or will not be elevated, protected, and looked after. To use Foucault's words, those who will be made to live or let die. In removing such decision-making from the oversight of the state, the rise of the identity document can be directly correlated with the incremental privatization of responsibilities once burdening the state and related to the maintenance, management, and preservation of civilian life. At the same time as the identity document has been synonymous with the decentralization and corporatization of state power, it, is also, uh, it has also come to signify its abuse. In this project, Oh, sorry, I was going to show you this image. So in this project, I argue that the reason behind the ID's proliferation and weaponization is to be sought in the photograph, that is in its version as a photographic identity document for two seemingly mutually opposed reasons. Firstly, the photograph is believed to render its human subject knowable through visual means, that is through simple optical analysis. As this project will make clear, photography's early instrumentalization by science and the discourse of objectivity that surrounded image production um, turned photographs into epistemic objects. Photography's capacity to magnify, to enhance, to extend and accelerate the human eye made it an essential tool for, in for scientific inquiry. To look at a photograph would mean to read the world for information. Consequently, 21st century viewers have been culturally trained to accept the contents of the photograph as self-evident and immediately accessible. In other words, because anyone and everyone feels up to the task of reading um, the photograph on the ID, so I'm referring to this situation here, in contrast to reading what it means to read an amorphous fingerprint, for example, or the lettering of a foreign language, which is also being represented here, the presumed ease of access through natural quote unquote human visuality has made the photo ID into the widespread means of verifying identity that it has become today. It is therefore somewhat paradoxical that the photograph, the aspect of the identity document that seems the most immediately legible um, has become the primary target of machines designed to supervise and replace human vision and human judgment. Computer programs written to scan and process the world for information have been in existence since the 1950s. After their first failed use to recognize the sound of the human no, voice. Um, <laughs> it's all right. It's all right. It's all right. Yeah, okay. So after their first failed application to recognize the human voice, their second objective was to read the human face. Starting in the 1970s, computer scientists began to feed large numbers of photographs of human faces into computers with the intention of automatizing image processing. Faces became, became human fodder to early artificial intelligence design. But it was only uh, starting in the 1990s um, that such laboratory circumstances would transition to real-time experimental um, systems um, deployed on the general public by the U.S. Department of Defense. And this is, this is an image from the, this first uh, public experiment um, called Ferret. Um, I will now give you a brief example of such a recent application the enthusiasm for automated recognition, it indicates and some of the risks associated with its application to faces at large. Okay, so sometime in January, 2020, a car supply shop manager called Robert Julian Borshak Williams received a phone call from the Detroit Police Department asking him to come in to be arrested. Although he thought it was a prank call, he drove to the station where he got promptly handcuffed and jailed. Williams had gotten arrested because of a shoplifting event two years prior in 2018 that had been caught on surveillance tape and that had produced a red flag when it was run through a facial recognition program the Michigan police purchased in 2019. The fact that the image on the basis of which he was arrested was a low quality scan of a low resolution video had not been deemed by the police to be sufficient grounds to make further inquiries. The next time his family saw Williams was after 30 days of prison time. The algorithm had mistaken him for someone else. 
uh, at this point, he was released and charges were dropped several months later. Williams is emblematic of the general state of vulnerability and embattlement to which automatized recognition practices have by now exposed us collectively as a society. Of the increasing number of faces uploaded to the internet on a daily basis, those that are tagged often get scraped and sold off on a multi-million dollar market that is now the facial recognition industry. But this is only one problem. The other problem which scholars, filmmakers, and industry whistleblowers have recently helped shed light on is that facial recognition algorithms don't work. Namely, that they are 10 to 100 times less likely to work on faces that are non-white and non-male, which means that their cumulative error over the general population ranges between 50 to 90%. What is even more problematic, however, is the extent to which our institutions of law enforcement and civic and state governance have accepted the state of affairs. Not even after Williams pointed out that beyond being black, he looked nothing like the person caught on the video, did any of the officers think to override the decision to arrest him. The problem is twofold, as the author of Weapons of Mass Destruction, Kathy O'Neill, has pointed out. Firstly, algorithms targeting the face are being used everywhere. Uh, now, not only by virtue of CCTV cameras, but also because of photographic identity documents. And because the mass proliferation of photo IDs that is a part of the privatization of civic infrastructures, um, they, there are increasingly few protections and privileges on which humans, rather than facial recognition algorithms, get to decide. In outsourcing civic, administ civic administrative processing to algorithms, we have conflated computer recognition of faces with the state's recognition of the rights of its citizens. As artists like Zach Blass, whose work I'm showing you here, um, have argued um, is specifically here with this thing that he, de he devised alongside um, several artists, which is called the facial cage, um, in which you can see exhibited as works of sculpture underneath the images of the artists then wearing them. Um, your face has now become a trap, uh, dispossessing you of your basic protections. This project seeks to understand how the face became entangled in artificial systems of intelligence. Why, <clears throat> when targeting the face, these must fail? And, and finally, to what better purpose the inscrutability of the face might be put? Uh, the project proceeds historically by proposing an archaeological exploration of recognition itself as a technique um, through the example of the photographic identity document. Through examining multiple types of discourse mobilized by identity photography, scientific, artistic, media, historical, and vernacular, the project proposes reading the identity document as a cultural technique or epistemic device through which the definition of subjectivity and state subjecthood are arguably still being negotiated. Okay. The automation of recognition did not always mean what it does today. That is, the short circuiting of human judgment. Because it is not the first time humans have attempted to model our sensory ability to identify form on the human body. Attempts started to be made to formalize the practice of interpreting, reading, or making legible the inner realm of motivation, um, will, or intention well before recognition became digitally engineered and algorithmic, algorithmically <laughs> driven. <laughs> Sorry, the practice of recognition in the sense of a formal um, epistemic device partially emerges in the context of ancient medicine. The most advanced systems of medical learning among the ancients, Arabic doctors, believed in the need to exceed the mere inventorying of human body organs. For the Persian polymath Fakhruddin Razi, there is a second aspect to each illness that cannot be so easily predicted and whose appearance need, needs to be read from the surface of the body. This ability to, I quote, judge rapidly and without error on the basis of exterior signs visible only to the trained eye is, um, is called um, firasa. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. Firasa. The term used to designate this kind of diagnostic discernment 
um, and that historians have interpreted as a practice of glancing or the art of detail um, turns out to have more in common with astrology and divination. The idea of diagnosing the body through consultation of the stars pervades early modern Western medicine as well by the principal um, uh, explanation with the principal explanation being the relationship between microscopic human, human realm and the macroscopic cosmos um, by power of analogy. The interest in introducing an additional epistemic device from far outside conventional science raises an important consideration regarding the purpose of physiognomy or the science of studying the face. Um, its main contribution to the history of science may be the introduction of an unknown variable, an X factor, because an unknown variable here, the heavenly analogy has been integrated into the consideration of the human subject. This second structure introduces an alternate framework through which statements about the subject are being produced. In the case of Saunders, um, another, sorry, another guy. So sorry, in the case of Saunders, so this is Richard Saunders um, uh, and his treatise on physiognomy. The result of this shift is illustrated through diagrammatic renditions. When astrological maps are brought to complement anatomy books, previously unremarkable forms will appear to surface on this human figure, such as blemishes to the skin like moles or beauty spots, resulting in a new set of coordinates by which to deduce medical character or type. The epistemic value of physiognomy seems less in the validation it might provide to medical discourse and more in the introduction of indeterminacy to the core of its methods. By juxtaposing occultist traditions to science, doctors ensured that no conclusion would be hastily drawn, that, it, that an overly simplistic and reductivist understanding of the human body, such as conceptions of humans as automata, uh, which was an encroaching paradigm at the time, that that this might actually prevent a slew of errors being made. Another arguably even more, more important contribution of physiognomies was the integration of the notion of a medium or of mediality as both a guide and a source of contingency for scientific analysis. Note here, for instance, the constitutive role played by the marks left by the ridges of the metallic etching support in mapping the face. Both the totality of the image representing an ideal face um, and the grid of possible contingencies on an individual specimen of such a subject are constituted by the same technical principle of printed illustration, namely the application onto the surface of the paper of daubs of ink in a series of concentric circles um, of relative thickness. The grid of beauty spots may as well be an error in printing. Rather than clarification, the medium of etched illustration contributes a form of controlled chaos, the temporary formlessness of an unknown uncharted mechanism. Physiognomy makes mediality integral to scientific analysis because of the presumed unknowability of the science the medium produces visually, whose incompatibility with prior analytic systems helped entrench precisely those biases and stereotypes of the medical gaze that are the most difficult to uproot and that might otherwise be driving forensic visual analysis. In seeking to counter scientific discourse's rigidified conceptions of human behavior, physiognomy seeks out the aleatory qualities of visual media to state something like an epistemic interruption. Coming back to the question of the photographic identity document, the effect of having an image on the face of the identity document does not in and of itself have to signify entrapment. Otherwise put, it is not at all clear that identity either can or was at all times believed to be captured and caged uh, by creating an image of someone's face. Insofar as it can be aligned with physiognomy, photography, uh, so the photomechanically created image, um, uh, physiognomy might be instead um, said to introduce unknown variables into identity processing, thereby preventing the risk of an overly hasty judgment call. The photograph was believed to greatly enhance the nation state's ability to trace and track its citizens at the time it became a standardized feature of certain European identity documents, namely international ones like passports. Historians researching the debate surrounding its addition 
um, so the, pho the photographs addition to the European passport between 1920 and 1926, uh, appears to have been heated enough uh, to warrant not one but two international summit meetings under the auspices of the League of Nations. Um, and they present the rationale behind photography to revolve around two concerns, a new immigrant workforce um, and the need to securitize identity. This is a technical term to securitize identity in consequence of the appearance of a large influx of migrants. There is certainly evidence of um, forged passports, stolen identities, and double gangers, um, or you know, uh, doubles, um, presenting a concern, uh, if nowhere else than in the cinematic imaginary of the period. And here I'm showing you passages from films about foreigners sporting a whole range of dubious intention um, while traveling to the West under false documents. Um, the one on the left is less known, um, Dark Journey. Um, it has the wonderful Weimar era uh, German emigre uh, actor Konrad Veidt, um, also the American Vivian Lee, who is, is co-scripted by a Hungarian. Um, but, and this you may not know, but some of you will probably be familiar with Orson Welles's film um, from 1946 called the, called the Stranger, which also features a lot of these um, emigre artists. Uh, and perhaps unsurprisingly, most of these films were also directed and scripted by emigres and Central Europeans in exile, um, despite everyone looking remarkably um, uh, dubious. The significance of the photographed face in the 1920s becomes quickly apparent upon its comparison with prior systems of recognition practice within the passport itself. To continue in the vein of identity documents making possible Central and Eastern European film and photography professionals massive emigration westwards, um, one might consult the passport of the film theorist Béla Balázs, um, with which the dissident Hungarian naturalized an Austrian citizen in the early 1920s migrated across Europe between 1928 when this passport was issued and the 1940s. The place for the passport photograph um, here, ironically missing, um, is designated using an empty square on the third page of the document. Opposite the passport photo appears a pre-photographic recognition system um, called signalization, um, an interesting term in and of itself, and consisting of verbal prompts for the textual description of the document's bearer with the categories, as we saw previously ranging um, here from very precise descriptive terms, such as profession, date of birth, time of birth, address, to less clear categories, um, such as face, um, eye color, hair color, and other particularities. The fact that writing, so it, I don't know if you can see, but next to a visage or gesicht, so somebody has written oval. Um, so the fact that writing oval in the rubric next to the prompt face um, would have in 1928 been deemed an adequate account of Bolage's appearance is not a little ironic, given the precision to which Bolage himself endeavored um, to describe photographed faces. But it also begins to suggest the deficiencies of this language-based recognition system um, that the photograph came to complement and arguably override. To rephrase Bila Balai speaking about moving photographic images, um, so he's, he was talking about film, um, photography made humans visible. Not necessarily to each other, although some might argue for Balazs's theory to be read as a form of media anthropology, but visible to an apparatus of observation, such as the film industry, the scientific laboratory, or the apparatus that is most relevant here, the state. Photography recorded more, virtually infinitely more information about faces, hair, eyes, and other particularities than any state officer could hope to register in the time and space they were given for the same recording in words. It's basis in light rather than language, the real rather than the symbolic, established a representational realm of the living state subject that was infinitely more precise 
than that which was the competing literary enterprise on the passport's opposing page. This type of storage system not only reconstructed bodies in hallucinatory detail, but also deemed to bear physical traces of their sitters, if early 20th century evidentiary me methods are to be believed. At the time when photographs of faces were being collected by document issuing state archives, other types of apparatus were busy at work mass producing them. Faces have been photographed ever since the commercialization of Arago's photography patent in 1838, but it was not until the late 1880s that the photographs reduced exposure time allowed the medium's integration into a range of observational scientific practices. One instant photography became pop, or sorry, once instant photography. So the kind of photography that employs um, a short, short exposure time and allows for snapshots to be produced. Once that became possible, photograph faces quickly became integral to the study of humans by ethnographers, anthropologists, biologists, eugenicists, criminologists, psychiatrists, um, psychologists, sociologists, and art critics and art practitioners. To be judged by the range of types of photographic album dedicated primarily um, to the photographed face that were created over the following um, 70 years, but starting in the 1920s, faces constituted a large part of the history of the development of the human and social sciences. They represented much of the evidence on the basis of which social and humanist discourse would be established. And they arguably also helped constitute the methods of these epistemic fields. And what interests me is the extent to which this ubiquity of the face implies the persistence of non-scientific forms of vision deep within the epistemic enterprise of the empirical sciences. And to what extent the history of the face as an epistemic device might be brought to bear on the automated facial recognition systems of the 20th and 21st centuries. What seems abundantly clear to me is that studying the roots of recognition practice today in the multiple histories of physiognomy might go a long way in showing why facial recognition still hasn't delivered. If photography's ability to render the face in detail proved its advantage over written recognition practices, it also constituted its limits. Um, it was too detailed too rooted in circumstance and too plastic in rendering. And the fact that it was the face that was the subject of the photograph did not help alleviate what was felt to be its excessive contingency. Together with the face um, and the photograph, um, what was created was a hall of mirrors, a message without a code, as Bart would say. The history of securitizing identity, that is of deploying recognition with the intent of establishing beyond the doubt the uniqueness of a person is therefore a history of a range of technical apparatus invented to tame physiognomy. There is a direct line between the appearance of um, the automatized photo booth that you see uh, in the 19th 20s here uh, illustrated on the right hand side and the fixtures immobilizing the criminal suspect uh, for purposes of anthropometric measurement that is illustrated on the left hand side um, and uh, which I'm happy to come back to uh, to explain because it is kind of a complicated um, apparatus. Um, uh, as was to a more limited extent. Um, the central artifact of the clerical statistical system of intelligence, the filing cabinet. But it, it's, and this is a very important and big, but it could be that there are other histories to be explored here. If physiognomy tells us anything, it is about the face's multiplicity. It is not just that the face is contingent. Historically, it has been instrumentalized as contingency itself which is why in this project, I aim to complicate the current conceptions of recognition's legacy in the history of science. Equally important, I argue, are its roots in the history of art and the history of vernacular culture or spectacle. Carte de visite, photo montage, caricature, portraits. This expansion in the range of types of discourse is necessary when approaching the earliest photographs to appear on passports 
simply because if you look at these images, they look nothing like mugshots or criminals, um, which is the connection we most readily make with identity photography. They, they're, they're people who are wearing glasses, there's, they're people who wear makeup, they're hats, they're veils, they're smiling. Um, people stand behind backgrounds um, or not, you know, um, they either face the camera or sometimes they turn away from the camera. Um, the photograph sometimes seems to have been um, taken by a, an official portraitist, um, but very often these photographs seem amateur or homemade. Um, interestingly, some of the photographs, um, uh, I mean, most of the photographs have one individual in them, but very often passport photographs actually have more than one individual in them. So, and from the perspective of, uh, you know, today's heavily standardized, heavily securitized recognition practices, this heterogeneity in the photograph may seem a little odd. Um, but I've, what I've tried to prove here is that this is not random. Um, no one to this day, after decades of discipline and intelligent design, looks like their passport photograph. The poor legibility that the face arguably continues to have um, serves a very precise function. Namely, it is a void that has to be complemented with something like conjecture, tact, firasa, or dialogue. So in conclusion, um, I want to return to the idea of the stakes um, involved in the legacy of the photographic identity document. Because with the proliferation of unsupervised ID checks, the stakes are only getting higher. Um, and in the frantic attempt to ban facial recognition and put an end to a new facial extraction economy, uh, we forget that the idea has had that the ID, sorry, has had a range of functions, some of which are essential to democracy. The securitization of identity was not the only reason for introducing the photograph. At this moment um, in the 1920s, which was post-war, it was also to adjust the operations of the sovereign state to the needs of those with no papers. Every single one of the photographs that I showed you on the previous slide were of refugees, asylum seekers, or stateless people. Some of them are from, or sorry, most of them are from what was called the Nansen passport, uh, named after the Norwegian statesman and humanitarian Frithof Nansen, which were issued at the time of the First World War and when a range of toppled revolutionary government led to a massive refugee crisis in Europe. The function here of the, of the passport and of the, photo, of the photograph is clearly humanitarian. By issuing the Nansen passport, governments overrode the normal pathological divide between foreign and native, refugee and citizen. And in extending state protections and welfare on the basis of their life, it treated these as universal and inalienable. As such, a case could be made for photographic identity documents to be considered a form of civil contract, which Ariela Azulay has argued in this wonderful book. That is, a situated encounter between the person in the photograph, the person viewing the photograph, and the application of the principle of universal human rights and state protections that are implied in this document's transformation of the individual into a state subject. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Esther. Uh, this was very rich, very thorough, um, and it's amazing. Uh, to, to have an overview of all the power stakes that hide uh, behind such uh, banal and everyday objects as is an identity document. Um, so uh, I will first ask if there are any questions already before uh, posing my own. Um, well, maybe I will start. Uh, so, um, your presentation really made me think about um, Paul Preciado and his, um, his work on um, identity documents and gender. So, I know this is a little bit off topic for you, but I'm still very curious if uh, doing an archaeology of photography, you could also see uh, any gender stakes being revealed 
what Preciado points out is that uh, identity documents always always push us to immediately uh, identify as a woman or as a man, and we can't actually exist socially and cross border if if we don't make this decision beforehand. So um, I'd be very curious to 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 know your point of view on the question. Yeah, um, I mean, so gender is. It's um, by virtue of sort of sort of having been made into this binary um, uh, way of, of distinguishing or of or of uh, creating triage in the population. Um, it sort of it does rehearse um, everything that is very static. It's like it's a way of reproducing bias. Um, and um, you know the the problems with this are um, are are multiple um, and um, it's it's interesting I mean what I'm what I'm I mean there are multiple ways of answering this question of gender I mean gender is clearly at stake um, first of all today uh, just a sort of like on a purely technical level um, the idea that gender is is kind of visible um, the idea that difference would be visible in the face um, the things that would separate us, um, that would make us unique, is not really something that facial recognition algorithms today are really capable of, of discerning. Um, and so what happens is that actually what these programs are looking for has been uh, predetermined. There is some, there is some flexibility. There is some dynamism in these network, in these, um, sorry, algorithms. And I can get into like the specifics of how they're dynamic. And but the but the point is that they are looking for a very like a predetermined formula of what it is that a face looks like, um, and what. Um, uh, several uh, sort of whistleblowers from within the industry have pointed out recently um, is that, you know, those for the, 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 the types of formula that constitute a face uh, for uh, computer vision for the eye of the, the, the computer um, is, is sort of very normative. Um, and that the, the reason we can notice this is because um, the, 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 the degree um, or the, the probability for error goes up if the machine is looking at um, faces that, that are either not male or gendered in a different way, um, or they are, uh, you know, faces of color. Um, so, so it's really, it's interesting that um, sort of the, the idea of differentiating, of accounting for um, sort of the kind of difference that gender uh, introduces visually is not really represented yet. Um, in these in this kind of software, which makes them very you know misogynistic um, and racist. Um, yeah, uh, there are other ways of answering that question. May I? Um, yeah, sorry. So no, yeah. Uh, uh, well, it's been uh, twelve years already. I wrote a piece on on that uh, and following uh, some other. Uh, uh, some other uh, theoricians like Dean Spade, Andrew Alex Sharp, William Eskridge, Nan Hunter, before uh, Preciado, uh, it was uh, uh, the questioning uh, the identity uh, inscribed uh, through gender, which is like uh, uh, advocating uh, the, the possibility of uh, skipping the uh, uh, gender um, in any format uh, uh, through uh, IDs before getting into the representative uh, uh, form. Uh, so uh, there is an expression in, uh, in French, uh, montre patte blanche, montre moi ta patte blanche, mm -hmm. which means uh, actually uh, uh, tell me your identity, gender identity, or tell me your identity uh, directly without going through uh, imaging. Uh, the point is that before reaching uh, the representative form of uh, gender or race whatsoever, uh, we need to uh, deconstruct it on the conceptual level. Mm -hmm. 
So uh, I followed uh, uh, thoroughly uh, what you did in uh, face recognition and uh, all that uh, that you pointed out. Uh, and it is a genealogical archeological approach, but I think that uh, in, in order to um, uh, go on and, and uh, uh, I'm sorry for the noise. Yeah. Uh, in order to, to uh, complete the, the job of uh, archaeologically uh, uh, going into uh, what does that mean uh, so that we can uh, abolish uh, through algorithms uh, the, the, that representative uh, part of the idea, uh, ID, uh, we, we, can, uh, we need to work on... on uh, uh, deconstructing the idea of uh, identity as as it is. Uh, to, to, so yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm 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 a bit challenging it uh, uh, because I think that uh, uh, it's uh, it's uh, uh, rather um, uh, only uh, through uh, 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 representation. It's not a uh, It's not enough radical. This is what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, yeah, okay. So I think I think I understand what you mean. I think I think um, uh, my my understanding. Um, I think uh, gender identity, like other types of identity, um, there there are certain debates here um, uh, regarding what is useful to be made visible and what is counterproductive to be made visible. And um, there's a lot of um, sort of um, uh, assumption um, that uh, sort of, so uh, on, within the discourse of uh, faces being made vis visible, there are two types of category of form that you can have. One is the kind of form that is super specific. And then there's the kind of form that is typical. And one of the um, one of the sort of the, the going um, types of argument that have been made is that um, you know if we proceed to to think of faces as primarily uh, constituted of typical features, that that what we're just doing is we're reproducing um, sort of biases that are potentially unexamined and that are being made manifest. But there's also a, a sort of a counter argument to this that has been recently emerging, which is that typicality is necessary in order to create some solidarity. Um, and so that there is this kind of return to um, a discourse not of uh, universalism, but of universal rights. Um, that that um, that is is important, I think, it, to 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 take into account uh, before dismissing this idea of a type. What I'm trying to show, though, is that um, is that there are different ways of of allowing people to um, sort of create, um, uh, to project affect onto these images, um, because that's essentially what we're talking about is that there's a lot of affect um, and in, in the process of identification that's been sort of baked into the system of identification and how that, how that is managed actually also determines the, the flexibility that is given to each unique you know, uh, person um, in, in being assessed. Um, and um, what I'm trying to show is that uh, is that there have been systems that are that are more, less and more dynamic, um, and that the the system of recognition that is based in words. Um, so this part of the identity document where you have to fill things out. I mean that just that really just doesn't work anymore um, because it's based. It's not a flexible, it's not a dynamic system. What I'm trying to argue is that the reason the photograph on the identity document is so important, and the reason it is such a shame that this is the thing that is being read by a machine um, and that is not no longer being read by the human, um, is that there, the categories of typicality are negotiable, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, this is what I'm trying to show. Yeah, no, with sorry, history. sorry, it's, it's okay. I, I, I follow your, it's a lot of, uh, on your plate. Uh, I just wanted to, to point out whenever you're going into that direction of typicality, stochastics and whatsoever, uh, you need to have in mind that this is a form of uh, normativization. 
This is something that is inscribed already in all uh, formats of uh, normativization, which is normalization, which allows that uh, uh, the, the, the thing that you go on and uh, you can uh, say that some, some uh, picture or the representation of someone's face is typical or generally accepted and uh, through features, uh, through this and that, and that you can make a difference compared to others. Uh, what I'm stating when I was uh, like my my intention was uh, to go uh, into radicality of the thing and uh, actually do not accept this kind of typology. Uh, uh, there might be, and it's up to us to work on that, uh, to go on and uh, do uh, some kind of recognition that is not needed through that kind of normative violence. Because for me, photography, whatever that is uh, in that uh, policing format, is uh, something that is pushing us into a normativity that is not uh, for each of us. And you represented it, you, you showed it through uh, this uh, misrecognitions and uh, uh, black people, especially in the United States, uh, dark color people, even the fact that you need to have the uh, light uh, uh, or white uh, background or to, uh, to, to, to just uh, dissimulate uh, your uh, uh, face features. So it's, uh, uh, I, I follow you uh, well, but uh, uh, I just uh, claim that right to go more radical into abolishing uh, uh, photography as a format of uh, 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 identity recognition, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, I understand there is um, within sort of the, the multiple voices that have been raised, there is the argument that the whole thing should be should be um, uh, made illegal, and I, I am not against that argument. Um, uh, it, it comes from a very um, important place of protest, um, and I I don't I don't think that I'm I, I'm not really assuming a position against or for that. What I'm trying to say is that the normatization that you are describing that is creating this, this sense of entrapment um, is not necessary and that it's being produced um, I'm, I'm, it, it's being produced by the automatization of vision and not by the photograph itself which which has been it's proven itself as through its history as a medium as a thoroughly non-normative source of contingency um, and difference so um, I think that the problem is the way is is the sort of the presumption that machines can just do this job for us, which is which is um, producing the, the that sense of of uh, surveillance and control society. Yeah, but the, uh, already the the uh, uh, whatever you use uh, your uh, the disposit uh, uh, like uh, the the. I don't know, it's a, you need a machine, Leica or Canon or whatsoever, it's already uh, uh, channeled, uh, the photography as a medium is already channeling uh, that technicality uh, in itself. Uh, this will bring us back to, to Benjamin and uh, uh, whatever we had uh, at the beginning of the century or even the, with the, uh, daguerreotypy whatsoever. It's uh, uh, the, the, the thing is that automatization or where we are, where we are standing here and now with algorithms uh, and face recognition uh, has been inscribed in, in uh, uh, the technology or the medium through mm -hmm. which we are uh, getting uh, uh, the ID as such. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Although I, I would say that there's a massive difference in the way people use cameras and the way people are using uh you know computers today in terms of reading the face we are we are um, there there we are together <laughs> it's okay i i don't uh, yeah. i don't uh, i don't uh, doubt what your, your claim is uh, okay with that but uh, uh as uh, again uh, i'll be much more radical into uh uh, claiming uh, uh what what you're saying it's just uh, the degree of uh, 
of intervention. Nothing, nothing mm -hmm. more. Okay. Mm. Well, maybe I would read Tom's question, which I think really relates to the debate oh. that just had. Okay. So uh, Tom's question is, do you see photographs as means of human identification going out anytime soon from social political practice? That yeah. is, do you think that ID policies will change in the future towards some other uh, non-face recognition based mechanism? Uh, in the sense, as you say, photography made humans visible. I really like that, but it might change in the future through some other form of technological monitoring. And he especially had in mind some forms of bio implants. That is why he's asking to be precise. And also, thank you for the inspired, inspiring presentation. Great. So, uh, is it possible to get Tom um, uh, somehow on like a mic or something? I'm not quite sure I understand the question. So, um, the idea is that. Um, that there, that given the bio, given bio implants, that there wouldn't be, that it wouldn't be necessary for there to be um, a kind of check at all, because it's just, if the bio implant is inside of the person um, and it is speaking to the machine that is assessing the person, then it's just like machine speaking to machine. And then there's no, is that, no. Wait, hold on. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. Um, I mean, I'm not quite sure how to approach the question of bio implants. Um, um, you, you just go on and connect, uh, for example, whatever uh, uh, science fiction film, uh, dystopian film, uh, whatever you, you, you can imagine like uh, uh, for, for recognizing, like checking the, the, the idea of the person that is uh, through iris or through, uh, uh, I don't know. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, any, so this any is, form yeah. Of, which, you know, it's, you don't have just a face recognition as such, yeah. but you have any other- At Other types of, or, okay, now uh, I, like understand. We, we I had understand. It, we had it in concentration camps with the number. You were not a face in a concentration camp, you were a number. So uh, that was also the idea of policing that allowed people to be uh, uh, checked and identified. You have also uh, all formats of uh, checking. For example, uh, I, I don't. I'm, I'm not. Uh, Tom is saying something. What is it? That, uh, uh, okay, so I can read out. Uh, yeah, go ahead. So, um, photography is currently being used by ML algorithms because it is the most precise and widely dispersed way of detection and monitoring, based on historical reasons as well, due to the technological development trajectory. But this might easily change in the future through bio implants, um, way more precise detection. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is this is this is uh, certainly the case. So, what I was trying to show is that there are there are different types of of um, of ways, techniques of deriving signs from the body. And some of them, you know, because they come from very different conceptions of the human body and what it is that, that typifies us, um, they have very, they can have very different results. So the photograph is one such uh, system, but there have been other systems um, like, for example, the iris scan or uh, fingerprinting, which is, uh, I think called dactylography, um, that are actually uh, scientifically, um, they've been shown to be a lot more precise than, um, than recognizing photographs of, of human faces um, uh, uh, through machine learning. Um, so, so I think that, that um, there are two things I would say. Is there is a uh, sort of a, a fantasy here um, uh, and that is creating a lot of, um, um, uh, anxiety, which is the fantasy of total transparency. Um, and um, that is, is one that has, if we go, you know, you look into science fiction up until the present day, I mean, and a lot of actually the, the kind of writing that is being produced about facial recognition, that it's still being written under this sort of, this, this um, the auspices of uh, transparency. Um, and that is creating 
um, a discourse of opacity. Uh, so if you have the fear of transparency, and then of course, the, what is the response to that? That is, okay, I'm gonna block my face, right? I'm going to wear a mask. I'm going to uh, uh, disappear. I'm going to like figure out how to disappear. Um, and that is, these two um, are connected. And the more there is this, this hype surrounding this technology, the more people are, ju are just gonna freak out. Um, and, the, and what I'm trying to say is that the more we lose opportunity for, for, for discussion and negotiation, um, uh, that is very important to protecting our civil rights and which is actually in, the, in, in opting to just like, to opt out of the system in just removing yourself and in disappearing from the system, actually the very populations um, who are already marginalized are the ones who are who are at most most at risk. Um, so so yeah. So there's this there's this discourse of transparency. To, in some cases, it actually is uh, the case that the that the technique that was invented is more precise. And this is the case for for the iris scan and for the fingerprint. And the fingerprint. It, so iris scan. This is very contemporary. The fingerprint. I mean, this predates the photograph like significantly um and what they and what's interesting is that it despite the fact that there is the fingerprint on the passport i think i showed you a, a, an um an example where you have the fingerprint there's still it's still not doing the thing that it's supposed to be doing so it in uh, what i'm trying to show is that there are different functions and whereas there are these techniques that allow for the precise um determination of what makes us unique um they exist they are represented they are very much alive and healthy um i don't think that that is the only function of the document because if you have a fingerprint or an iris scan what does that do that basically it's aiming to be able to do something that no human can do, which is that it's trying to like go through all the millions and billions of people on this planet and it's going to say, this is, this is the one, right? This is the one. It, and that's called identification. Um, and I think that I think that when we think of identity documents, that's obviously the first thing that we think about. Like this is identifying me. Like as soon as like I am seen by the state, or as, as soon as I'm like scanned, I'm seen. Like, and I have no idea what kind of information this the, this particular version of the mechanism might have. But that's that's a really frightening thing. Um, but um, but I don't think that's the only function. I think that there that 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 the photograph is there. I'm trying to show in order to prevent precisely that kind of identification to pre to prevent the assumption that there is um uh an identity to be fixed or that identity can be fixed what i'm trying to show is that people have there is a right you have a right to have an identity and that that identity is instantiated in these situations where there is face-to-face -face contact with someone who is representing something that you need access to. And that, that the photograph is allowing for um, precisely the evasion of this binary between transparency and, and opacity. And it's, it's because it doesn't work. Um, it's because it has this legacy, you know, um, of people like, you know, using photographs for completely different purposes that it can, it can continue to um, uphold the promise of the state, which is to, which is do justice. Um, yeah. Um, thank what you. What was happening before? What was happening before the nineteenth century? Before the nation state. Yeah. Right. Exactly. <laughs> so, I mean. Okay. <laughs> Are there any other questions? I don't think so. Um, well, thanks so much, Esther. This was so informative, so inspiring. Um, and yeah, I hope we will continue the conversation in some other forms. Yes. Uh, and Emilia also says, thank you very much. Uh, and I think uh, we can go have lunch now. Okay. <laughs> it was lovely to meet you. I hope that I will meet you in person at some point. Likewise, yes. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. Take bye. care. Bye-bye.